So welcome everybody um, to the feedback session. Um, the aim of this session is to share the main points that arose during the program discussions this week. Uh, I know that many of you would have liked to have attended all of the program sessions, but unfortunately that wasn't possible. But here's the chance to hear what was discussed, um, what the main challenges identified were, um, in some cases the priorities for research that were identified, uh, the proposed focus of NRI's research in the respective areas, and the next steps to develop that further. So I think we'll um, group them slightly differently. If uh, Julia would like to go first with um, food systems and nutrition, uh, and then Ben with food loss and waste, then Yona sustainable agricultural intensification, and John Morton with climate change. Okay, I'll hand over to uh, Richard Lambol now, who's going to um, keep, keep everybody to time and facilitate the session. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Adrian. Um, yes, so uh, as uh, Adrian said, uh, if we start off with uh, uh, Julia, so the idea will be, Julia, you'll have roughly seven minutes to present, and then there'll be roughly seven minutes for people to uh, raise any uh, queries and uh, questions if you could put queries and questions into the chat window uh, as, as the presenter is speaking, and then um, we'll put those to the, to the speaker in, within that seven minutes following uh, the seven minute presentation, and then we'll move on to the next one. So yeah, please, Julia, thank you. Yeah, we had our, our session on Tuesday. Um, our session was based around uh, um, around two themes. Um, so we structured the session as uh, two uh, short panel sessions with a series of um, very short presentations from both NRI and external speakers, um, each followed by a question and answer session, and then moving into some breakout groups where participants had a chance to kind of reflect, share their own experiences and discuss future direction. Um, we kind of tried to gauge the, the spectrum of participants with a couple of um, polls. So we, we had a fair spectrum of um, experience in terms of the uh, geographic areas in which people had worked on food systems um, and also the kind of breadth of disciplinary uh, kind of backgrounds of our um, session participants. So I have quite a lot of words on the next few slides but I'll just uh, draw out a few of the you know key points. Um, our first panel session was around um, this kind of notion of food systems thinking, which has obviously risen in prominence in, in recent years and has um, become a kind of a go-to approach for discussions around food and nutrition. So our first panel was sort of reflecting on, on concepts and frameworks relating to food systems um, and um, I guess reflecting on how that applies to research practice, uh, some of the challenges and opportunities. Um, so even though the challenges here appear to outweigh the strengths, um, I guess the challenges are um, to some extent people's reflections on how food systems thinking can be kind of improved and broadened. Um, I guess the strengths that came across were that um, food systems thinking enables us to work in, in with quite complex phenomena, have wide perspectives, think about interactions, um, this, this notion of food systems as um, supporting identification of entry points for both research and actions um, came through. And also encouraging that, that shift away from focusing on agricultural production and um, thinking in, in a wider way about um, strategies, both for nutrition, but also for other outcomes. Um, when it came to challenges, uh, there was some reflection on, on, the, on the difficulty of conducting research within food systems, the, the kind of metrics and the methods that are required for, for these complex concepts and mechanisms. Um, there was a sense that sometimes frameworks are too complex to actually inform and develop um, specific actions. Um, a few people uh, kind of voiced the feeling that they found it difficult to position themselves within this kind of food systems framing um, and how to kind of develop their research questions through this kind of wider lens um, was difficult. 
Um, a couple of people felt that uh, when we work in this sort of systemic way, it, it um, has the potential to diminish the feeling of relevance or importance of a particular discipline or, um, you know, a vast technical expertise gets reduced to a single line on a page or a single box in a framework. Um, and also potential for some sense of conflict between different disciplines and, and different sectors um, within food systems. And I guess some examples of that were feelings around food safety, perhaps not, not being recognised adequately within food systems, um, inadequate consideration of power relationships, inequalities, decision-making processes, um, and issues around food sovereignty. Um, shifting swiftly to the second theme of our session, uh, we, um, I should acknowledge that, that last session was um, steered to some extent by Chris Turner uh, within a kind of team of us who were working on this um, session. And this theme was um, uh, kind of managed largely by uh, Laura uh, Forsyth. It was kind of a bit of a partnership with the Gender and Social Difference Development Program. Um, and so within this, we were considering issues of gender equity and diversity within the context of food systems for nutrition. Um, so obviously a subset of the broader program that Laura leads. Um, and so some of the things that we were exploring were issues around women's empowerment, um, different approaches, empowerment as a kind of a mechanism for improving nutrition and food security compared to uh, empowerment as an end unto itself. Um, we had a few presentations and a lot of discussion around challenges in measuring empowerment um, and also um, various forms of, kind of power relations, intersectional aspects of equity. So I think this, this was a really interesting panel and led to a lot of interesting discussion within our breakout groups. Um, there was a, a sense by, by many people in, in the session about um, I guess the challenges in approaching gender equity and diversity in food systems research um, and that ag nutrition projects are often, um, you know, these multidisciplinary teams and, and not everyone has the, the skills and capacity to, to really delve effectively into these issues. And so um, also, yeah, a lot of reflection on um, pathways to empowerment, the complexity that exists, um, the difficulty in representing these complex issues with a single index. So a bit of um, carryover from, from the previous theme as well. Um, and also a sense that empowerment for nutrition varies a lot between contexts and, and often relies on substantial changes in existing um, norms and practices. Moving on to kind of some of our key issues and our takeaway, um, takeaways from the session. And there was a sense that frameworks need to be responsive, outcome focused, inform research, but not define it. Um, throughout the session, there was a lot of talk about the need for better, better toolkits and metrics to, to kind of effectively work in this space. There's some interesting contrasts in perspectives with some people within this session, um, highlighting the need to continue to develop and refine our conceptual frameworks around food systems. There were some other people who felt that we, we, we risk becoming a bit too academic in some of these discussions and investing a lot of time and resources in these kind of frameworks and tools, um, potentially at, at the expense of action research um, instead. Um, and there was, yeah, I think an interesting takeaway, you know, being that perhaps we need to look for evidence that frameworks and systemic uh, approaches to food and nutrition have an impact um, and contribute to improved research and practice. And so kind of delving into, you know, exploring case studies of, of where successful and unsuccessful research has been based around food systems. Um, I guess the takeaways were that food systems frameworks need to engage stakeholders um, and also that there might be some, some need for further education and training around the use of these concepts. Um, yeah, I guess an interesting, in, in both panels, there was some reflection on the idea of outcomes which may either be kind of mutually beneficial or potentially may be in conflict um, and the need to sort of account for trade-offs and unintended consequences 
within um, food systems research and um, issues around empowerment, equity, diversity. So uh, finally, my last slide um, is a, is sort of reflecting on yeah, the ongoing need for capacity building and support to be working within um, food systems and working on issues of gender equity and diversity, particularly in multidisciplinary teams. Um, we talked about um, yeah, different pa pathways for integrating modern and traditional knowledge. Um, for example, in Indigenous food systems, thinking about intercultural models of, of research and practice. Um, providing options for empowerment and enabling choices to be made um, rather than having a kind of a prescriptive approach to what, what it means for empowerment to exist within a food systems concept. Um, and I guess there were some broader reflections about thinking about equitable partnerships and research design, um, needing to consult effectively with food system stakeholders to um, you know, produce grounded, effective research proposals and outcomes. And so I guess just to finish with some of the kind of actions that I think may come out of our session, um, I think it, we, we were probably a little ambitious in how much we tried to cover within um, the, the conference uh, context. But I think we started some very interesting conversations, both within NRI, um, with fancy partners, and also some external um, organizations, institutions that, that were part of the session. So I think um, these kind of broad ideas around uh, food systems research and gender equity and diversity in food systems have kind of been brought to the table. I think there's hopefully discussions that we can take forward. I guess our, our two sort of tangible thoughts about actions to emerge from this week's event. Um, what is the possibility of a seminar series um, potentially hosted kind of in conjunction with FANCY or, or through uh, one or both of the uh, development programs that were kind of hosting this session um, to kind of continue some of these um, discussion and reflection on issues. Um, and our other thought was that, you know, we had some really interesting and engaging discussions and some of these perspectives might be translated through to some sort of short um, article or kind of perspectives piece by people who are part of the session. I think that's all from me. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Julia. Um, we've got a couple of uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> one coming in from Ben. Um, comment here, we did not really discuss how food systems models might be applied practically, for example, in governments and local government. What evidence is there of good practice and could we provide this? Yeah, I think that um, that was echoed by several people when it came to some of the breakout group discussions. I'm not sure if you're part of those, Ben. Um, but yeah, I think it's true. This idea that, um, you know, demonstrating the benefits of this kind of food systems approach to, to many issues that have been approached through many other framings and um, perspectives previously. Um, I guess it's kind of a, a definitely a, a developing area of work and a, a framing that's gaining a lot of prominence. Um, it's hard to, to discuss food security and nutrition without discussing food systems these days. Um, but I think um, particularly through things like our um, Centre for Doctoral Training and through FANCY, I guess there's opportunities for NRI to, you know, delve into some of the evidence that exists, um, I would hope. Okay, thanks. And then a comment from Alex, you might like to respond. Regarding the definition of food systems, uh, we should be able to strike the right balance between an academic perspective and that of implementing ages, agencies and partners. Actually, I think that's the space in which we should operate. Does that, do you feel that's where the program should be? Yeah, um, yeah, that was a, a point that came out um, I think from Joyce Kinabo's presentation um, from Sokowini University and also the Tanzania Food and Nutrition um, Centre. Uh, she kind of reflecting on, uh, she seemed an advocate for food systems um, kind of framing and research, but kind of really highlighting the need for it to be kind of a, a relevant and accessible notion that, 
you know, is not just the realm of um, academics, but kind of translates through to something that's, um, I guess, uh, both interesting and, and applicable to implementers and beneficiaries. And um, I think, yeah, I think many of us would share that sort of um, perspective. Right. Okay. Right. Thanks a lot, Julia. Um, We've got some further questions coming through, but I think we've uh, slightly run out of time for this session. So maybe perhaps you could pick up those in the chat box um, and queries. And uh, yeah, so thanks a lot. And uh, we'll move on to the next session. Very nice uh, presentation, a really useful session by the looks of it. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, so moving on to the next presenter, that'll be Ben. And Ben's going to present the food loss and waste uh, session. Uh, hi, Richard. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I, I didn't really want to follow Julia. She, she'd done much nicer slides than me, so I feel uh, I, I have slide envy. Um, it's my forte, Ben. <laughs> yeah, it is. I stole some of your slides for the beginning of my session. Thank you for that. Um, uh, right. So uh, yeah, these are the questions that we were um, asked to uh, address in this feedback session. Um, and, and these are just my, my very quick uh, take homes um, on, on, on kind of highlights of the conversation. I'd be really grateful if other uh, presenters in the session could put you know, things I've missed in the chat because I know there were other things um, uh, that, that, that were important. Um, that the... Um, uh, one, of, one of the problems that comes up again and again when you discuss food loss and waste, I, I'm going to start with the second bullet point. Um, we continue to struggle with this issue of definitions. Um, you know, we've been at it as many years as I can rem remember, trying to make definitions of what a post-harvest loss is, what is food loss and waste. Um, and, and despite a sort of coalition around the WRI, uh, World Resource Inst Institute definitions, people still not happy with them. Um, and, and they're open to all sorts of confusion and, and, and you know, poor application and definition still a huge issue um, and, and will continue to be uh, for, for some time. Uh, as we unpack more and more, uh, we look at more and more systems from the point of view of food loss and waste, uh, you, you find more and more problems with the definition. Um, uh, data poverty is uh, in food loss and waste is a, is a consistent problem. It costs a lot of money to get good quality information. Came up again and again, not uh, uh, not just in a purpose kind of summary of the different methods that we apply, but uh, you know just about everywhere. So what we end up with is is aggregate data based on not very good uh, analysis or very poor um, national um, uh, production data, um, which which drives policy from you know, from a mistaken perspective. Um, so either we stick in the middle and we say it's 30% food loss and waste everywhere for everything, um, or we, um, we, we look really closely and we find some shocking examples, or we find actually quite often that, that, that systems have adjusted to manage the risk of food loss and waste, and therefore there isn't very much when you go out and actually look for it. So, you know, all of these things that hold true uh, and, and speak to this data poverty issue. Um, you know, we're all it, it, we're in, in food systems speak. We're always looking for trade-offs, um, and and um, there's lots and lots of them as we kind of meld food loss and waste into the food systems conversation. Um, but these trade-offs are still very badly informed, very very case specific. Um, you know, there are no there, there's no genuine kind of uh, box of box of wrenches and hammers and screwdrivers where we can. Say, say to people, you know, if you use this particular screwdriver, you'll be able to work out uh, what happens to the environment when you decide to change uh, this policy in this way, or, or if it, it helps these people or takes away from those. That this, the, the, the challenge, the, one of the big challenges in food loss and waste is this you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul problem. Uh, whenever you change something, you impact on somebody else at some point within this system. And we don't really understand. We still don't have the tools to understand that, to, to reveal that in, in any sensible way. Um, and, and reasonably cheaply, it's expensive to do research in this area as well, as the FAO have found, because, you know, they've, they've applied an approach that, that looks great, but is really expensive to do. So nobody can afford to do it. So there's not much data. Um, if, you look at the, um, if you look at the value chain, 
um, or value chains in general. Um, the knowledge gaps, um, th there's quite a lot of kind of stuff in the middle. We've been working on, you know, storage issues, for example, for decades. Um, but um, uh, where, where you find knowledge is thin uh, is at either end. Um, it, it's, it, it's in the field. Uh, In-field losses, we always assumed were very small, but I'm not so sure that's the case. Um, and, and we kind of just ignored them until fairly recently. Uh, and, and then, you know, there's a massive challenge and try to work out, work out what's going on inside people's homes um, and inside people's minds when they make decisions uh, about what they buy and how they, how they prepare it and how they cook it and what they do with it when it's, you know, slightly smelly and not edible anymore um, from, from lots of different um, cultural exp perspectives. Um, we, we didn't really talk very much about the, about mitigating risks. And it's certainly my experience that one, w w that, as I said earlier, you, do, you often go and look for, for, for losses and don't find them because the whole system's changed to mitigate the risk of a loss occurring. Um, so we, we didn't really manage that very well. Uh, and we didn't have any, you know, anybody particularly talking to that issue. Um, I, I, think it's, uh, I, I think it was really good that we had some presentations of, you know, some of the post, particularly post-harvest work that's going on from our colleagues in Nigeria, because what that highlights is that there's, there's lots of ideas and technologies and people and capacity be, being built, um, uh, that there is, there is a, a far greater scope for a community of practice as, uh, that, than, than currently exists. You know, we just need to try to encourage it and finance it, uh, and particularly encourage um, you know, governments to, to realize that this issue is important and get, put some money into it rather than being don a donor-driven uh, construct. Um, uh, we, we, um, I, I, I think it's true to say that the capacity to understand much of the research that's coming out and m many of these frameworks and models that are coming out is a bit thin um, in, in, in many of the countries that we're working in. And so there's a need for capacity building. All of that great, uh, you know, post-harvest um, uh, infrastructure from the 1970s has, has, has largely now dissipated needs to be reconstructed again. Um, and, and it's noticeable that we, we didn't, we, we don't really reach out into the realm of political economy. And I think it's a really interesting thing to do in this, as far as food loss and waste is concerned. Um, proposed future focus of NRI research in this area. Um, I, I, think, I think we should focus on pivots. Um, uh, uh, Parag uh, said something in the chat right at the end about digitization, and I think it's a very positive, um, um, a, a very positive thing uh, to you know th to think about the the pivots, the big changes that we could make, and 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 being uh, sensors and digitization and, and 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 the Internet of Things gives us all sorts of possibilities uh, for new research practice and solutions for the future. Um, more and better data collection, analysis, and dissemination goes without saying. Um, greater emphasis on uh, how food loss and waste practice and research fits into the into food systems thinking. So you quite often find these uh, very beautiful um, food systems diagrams. Don't really know what to do with food loss and waste, and or, and you know it's also why they they miss out uh, food safety uh, quite often. Um, more understanding on issues like governance and drivers for change. So, I mean, it speaks to my question to the last session, really. Uh, having, I've spent quite a lot of my career sitting in, in different ministries of agriculture, policy departments, um, uh, what, they, what they're going to do with, uh, with frameworks and how they're going to turn those into practical solutions. It's not, I, I, don't, I don't really uh, see it from a day-to-day -day perspective. So and we need to address that. Um, uh, more, a more active uh, community of practice in food loss and waste would be a fantastic thing, and we should encourage, uh, encourage in some way. There is an existing FAO um, community of practice, but I, I don't see it actually making much progress. Next steps. Um, I, I have a generic question about where, where AFLIS, uh, African Post Office Loss Information System, is going to go, which I just throw out there and I don't really expect an answer, but it's a good thing that we do, and we've, it look, it's now looking very nice. Um, I, I worry about its, its future life. Um, having just finished a Horizon 2020 proposal, which focused on TRL, TRL levels five to eight, um, I, I think we've, we've, had a, we've had a period in NRI which has been research focused. Maybe now we need a, a period uh, that's a bit more applied, um, hopefully after COVID, where we can actually go and do some field work. 
Um, and, and I think we could, should start to think a bit more about scaling. It's something that we've, you know, some of us have put our minds to over the years, but um, I think it's going to be the, um, I think it's going to be the big issue for the future. Um, so uh, where are we going with the food loss and waste program? Well, I, I'm editing a special edition of Enterprise and Microfinance. This is now planned for December. So I'm hoping that, uh, that quite a few of, of the um, presentations that we had will be converted into papers that will be accepted uh, for that. And we'll go alongside um, uh, papers from uh, some other um, uh, thought-provoking folk from this field. Okay, Ben. Yes, thanks a lot. Well, you're looking for that. Um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, thanks a lot for that. Uh, very clear <clears throat> outcomes from the food loss and waste session. Um, got a query here or a question or a comment really from Keith that you might like to respond to. Um, will no, I, I don't want to, I don't want to talk to, you. <laughs> to Keith. Right now. Okay. Uh, will post COVID uh, provide an opportunity to better reduce food loss and waste? Would be nice if we don't return to normal after COVID, but rather move forwards. How can NRI and others do this? So is, is this an opportunity? I think, as you know, as ever, it's a thought-provoking question uh, from Keith. The, the recent evidence of behavioural change, consumer behavioural change, from food loss and waste is really very disappointing. Um, uh, there's 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 a couple of papers coming out in America, uh, come out in America recently that showed that after an initial burst of enthusiasm for not throwing stuff out straight from the buying stuff, putting it in the fridge, and then putting it straight in the bin, um, uh, that it. it People people did better for about nine months and then they reverted to where they were before. So I suspect that that is that will be the case after COVID. People, you know, human beings have a great great ability to bounce back and also to return to the same behaviours that they had hardwired in them before. So I, I'm not sure. I, I'm a cynic. I'm afraid. I'm not sure we will have see big changes. Okay. Thanks. And. Um... A question from Valerie, which I suppose you could say is perhaps um, uh, linked to this to some extent. Um, it says, uh, Ben, could you explore <coughs> more the political economy questions we should be, which should be considered from your food loss and waste perspective? Yes, heavens. I, I think it's a really, really interesting thing to start to to tease out. You know, the 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 uh, the the power that retailers, for example, have within the um, food loss and waste uh, microeconomy is, is really out of proportion. Uh, you know, a big reason why we, we buy too much, uh, overconsume, take it home in, and, and preserve it in our fridges uh, for a long time and then throw it away is because uh, uh, the retail sector is highly competitive. Um, we like cheap food um, and they want to sell us more of it. Um, so you know that's that's a that's a nice political economy question because you know, should actually we see some intervention uh, by governments to stop that? I, I, uh, Delia made you know the very passionately made the point that regulation doesn't work for food safety, and she's absolutely she's absolutely right. And I'm not sure that regulation will will, will work for um, uh, for food loss and waste. But we need a range of different tools, ranging from from you know. Reg regulation and people being thrown into prison to, to behavioral change and um, uh, education of children, and, you know, lots of different things that you can do. Um, but you, you need the political will to do that. Um, you know, where, where you see where you see real food loss and waste reduction going on or in con in, in, in economies um, where politicians have taken decisions to to make a change. Finland is a really good example, actually, at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Ben. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's a really uh, very interesting area, as you say. I think to explore further, um, maybe closer to home as well as in other countries. I, th I think there's some really interesting PhDs to be done on political economy of food loss and waste. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, that's the only time we've got, I'm afraid, on the on the food and loss and waste. So we'll move on. But thanks. That another very very interesting session. Um, Moving on to the third summary, uh, thanks Ben. Um, that's going to be now on sustainable agriculture intensification. And I'd like to invite Jana please to give uh, a summary of, of the outcomes. 
Um, so yeah, uh, our session was on sustainable agricultural intensification uh, and food and nutrition security. Um, and we have uh, subdivided our session into two uh, themes or two uh, sub-sessions. One was on uh, the future position and relevance of smallholder uh, farmers in the South. And the second one was uh, towards a smallholder centered and smallholder driven strategy for future sustainable agricultural intensification. Um, what we did was uh, we invited five uh, external uh, speakers, speakers that are affiliated to um, our fancy uh, partner organizations. So these were uh, Rolando Serra from uh, Cartier, uh, Angela McKinney from the Nelson Mandela, um, always difficult to pronounce this name, uh, the, the N-M-I-A-I-S-T. <laughs> um, then uh, Blessings Chinsingawa from, uh, Chinsinga from uh, University of Malawi and uh, Kolawole uh, Adebayo from FUNAP and Jibrin Jibrin from Bayero University. So what we asked them is um, to, to talk about the, their, their work uh, and then particularly focusing on uh, smallholder agricultures and how they uh, interact with them. And we asked them some uh, sort of yeah, thought provoking uh, questions uh, regarding the future uh, of them, uh, the future position and relevance of them. Um, sort of asking, um, well, one of the questions was, uh, will, there, will there even be a smallholder uh, agriculture? Will there be smallholder farmers in uh, 2050? And so uh, I have tried to, to, um, to uh, well, I've asked them to, um, to relate that back to, to their work and to give their perspective on that. And the second part of the, the session was um, uh, where Lakshmi and me uh, presented the uh, position paper that we are working on um, with NRI um, colleagues and also later on with, uh, with uh, fancy partners. So we are working on a, um, a position paper where we talk about sustainable intensification, agricultural intensification, and what our um, what we think that is that what we what we think it is that we as NRI uh, can contribute in, in partnership with others, and how SAI uh, can be achieved. Um, so yeah, that was uh, actually the last part of the session. But let me just uh, for this uh, recap just uh, start with start with that last part. So that, that is the, uh, the position paper. Um, so uh, we uh, identified uh, three main goals for uh, sustainable agriculture intensification. Uh, productivity increase uh, with uh, minimal impact on the environment, um, environmental conservation, and also uh, social well-being of, uh, of all stakeholders, but in particular uh, the smallholder farmers. Um, our position paper is mainly focused on, on the South. So it's not uh, sustainable agricultural intensification uh, at large, so to speak. So, and then we thought like, okay, what, what, um, what do SAI solutions, uh, like uh, agronomic uh, solutions, uh, but also, uh, well, farm solutions uh, uh, on sustainable agricultural intensification, what do they need to, to achieve? Uh, well, um, so we thought like, okay, they need um, not only what, sorry, not what they need to uh, uh, achieve, but what, what should they look like? So in order to be successful, so they need to uh, affect, uh, to address and effect, uh, effectively address uh, local constraints and needs. They need to be adapted and uh, or adaptable to local conditions and farming systems. They also need to be embedded in uh, institutional uh, environments. And we thought it's really important that uh, they need to be supported and owned or driven by local communities. So that means that uh, if you are looking for solutions to, uh, for smallholder agriculture, that, uh, for smallholder farmers, that it needs to capitalize on available and locally adapted and low cost uh, resources. Uh, we also uh, thought it uh, would need to imply acceptable investment risks to smallholder farmers. And if those risks are, are, are known, or uh, at least if you can sort of foresee some of those risks, 
they need to be clearly communi uh, communicated, so transparently communicated to smallholder farmers so that they know uh, on beforehand uh, what, what the risks are. Uh, so if you are implementing, um, if you want to uh, implement locally uh, sustainable agricultural intensification at the farm level, we thought, uh, well, we think that it is important that, that uh, researchers uh, or agricultural research and uh, for development actors, that they follow an iterative and stepwise approach over time. So to ensure that uh, the methods, the uh, production methods are locally adapted, that the, the stakeholders uh, understand um, and also believe uh, in them, uh, and to make sure that these that all solutions are feasible and uh, and affordable. So this is uh, sort of the uh, schematic approach that we that we came up with uh, that we think that. Uh, well, where we sort of identified the, the role of, of NRI. So uh, this is an iterative uh, uh, approach towards uh, uh, um, developing, but also uh, scaling uh, sustainable agricultural intensification solutions. So it starts with uh, generating building blocks, uh, evidence-based, so they should be grounded on ecological and biological uh, principles. These could then be building blocks for co-designing uh, systems, uh, uh, flexible and adapt uh, adaptable sustainable agricultural uh, systems. Uh, and this should then be uh, scaled uh, mainstreamed uh, with, um, with stakeholders. Uh, and um, this involves also uh, training and, uh, and things like that. So, uh, on the first, uh, in this first step, well, it is iterative, so it will it will um, go back and forth. Um, but on the in this first step is where we see that uh, NRI could possibly uh, lead in in, in research uh, together with southern partners, not necessarily lead, but at least this is where we have perhaps a, a compar comparative advantage. And then in the second step, this is really something that Southern partners should lead in uh, and work on, collaborative. And then um, uh, the, we would have shared leadership in terms of the, uh, the mainstreaming, the scaling part. So then um, the uh, views of the speakers and the, the participants of the session, um, so Blessing Chinzinga took a more uh, political economic uh, uh, approach to the, to the problem and also identified what would be the best uh, returns for investment in agriculture. Uh, he mentioned um, agricultural research for development and extension as an, an important investment um, uh, sector. Uh, alongside infrastructure, uh, and he points out that uh, smallholders comprise a widely diverse group of stakeholders, which we, of course, agree on. And that is also making uh, this whole exercise uh, quite complex. Then uh, Cola um, mentioned, uh, was talking about the specific needs for smallholders in terms of appropriate technology to increase labor productivity, uh, market and credit access, and farmer organization and uh, extension. Now, my cursor doesn't work anymore. Okay, Rolando Serra uh, was talking about the uh, agroecological underpinnings of improved coffee and cocoa systems and trade-offs between intensification and sustainability. He pointed out that uh, there is a need for improved varieties uh, in combination with improved management systems for agroforestry. And he also pointed out at the uh, usefulness of um, producing electronic decision uh, tools for uh, cocoa and coffee um, users. Angela uh, then talked about their, uh, their work on uh, the local production of uh, botanical pesticides and the, um, the farmer uh, experimental work that they do uh, and also farmer trainings. And Gibrin, Gibrin talked mainly about the projects that they have within Bayero University, more specifically uh, the um, Center for Dryland uh, Agriculture um, and uh, the innovation they, uh, that they are uh, promote, uh, promoting. And he advocates improvement of extension services and infrastructure. Um, so all of the speakers, well, in a certain way, uh, validated our uh, SAI strategy. Um, 
and again this will be uh, something that will be worked on in, in in future so this is a sort of a working uh, paper um, they all uh, uh, pointed out of the need of uh, context uh, specific technology one size fits all does not help and sorry and they um, they all worked on or were aware of the need for co-designing of systems there was not much emphasis on the mainstreaming scaling part from their side. Um, aspects to integrate or elaborate on, uh, according to the, the, the participants of the session, were the scale issue. Uh, we were mainly talking about farm scale, but we should also include landscape and perhaps even higher scales. Um, to develop in farm institutional capacity, to involve also, to include also uh, indigenous knowledge of, of farmers and other stakeholders, and to identify local champions, uh, innovator farmers for our approaches, uh, and also to involve policymakers. Uh, one, uh, well, all of the speakers, uh, apart from one, thought that uh, smallholders would still uh, exist in 2050, although they were all quite pessimistic uh, about uh, how the smallholder futures would look like. And this was because of population growth, climate change, but also land grabbing was quite often mentioned, at least uh, by uh, blessings. Um, and also they pointed out that there is a lack of an investment in public resources and infrastructure and um, negative impact of also of subsidies on productivity. Um, they also said, well, some of them at least said that it's still worth, uh, well, I would say most of them, would also, uh, they all um, are in favor of um, future investments in smallholder farming. And that's because they are uh, productive, uh, eff efficient and, and relatively productive because they can put more attention to smaller areas of land with uh, higher input levels. Um, and um, and also they are more equitable than large scale farmers and uh, they can uh, generate considerable uh, local multipliers. So that was it. Okay, thanks Jan, very much for the, the summary. Um, we've got quite a few questions in the chat box, but we've only really got time to answer maybe one, yeah, one really. So Yeah, I also don't have a lot of time because I have to rush to my... Uh, lecture i'm teaching it <laughs> yeah okay so let me just pick out one of the questions and maybe you can reply to the others in the in the chat box uh yeah. question from kate uh sorry i missed this very interesting session did you have a look at engagement of consumers in side products and development of input and output markets no we have not really paid attention to that yet and we have not um, included that in our uh, paper really explicitly. So yeah, it, that could be a point that we can in include as well. We have looked at it more from an agronomic uh, perspective, a farm uh, level perspective, and that's mainly because of my background. But um, I think, um, well, this is a working paper, a position paper. So the few, in, I mean, the next steps are to to fine tune this um, this paper and to also include other views from from colleagues and also the, the the fancy partners that we had invited for this talk. So there's still quite a lot of room for for uh, improvement. Although I'm also a bit concerned about the focus of the of the paper it's, itself, but it is a good, uh, it's a relevant point indeed. Okay. Okay, thanks, Jan. Um, yeah, sorry, we don't have time for the other questions, but if you perhaps could address them in, in the chat box, that would be really good. Yeah, I'm not sure if I have a lot of time for that, <laughs> because I need to go. Okay, or maybe others could. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, thanks. thanks. Uh, so, uh, just going to the final session now, and that's from John, who's going to present on the, the climate change. Um, yeah, so we had a session on how can research contribute to tackling climate emergency in food and agriculture systems up to 2030. We had five relatively short presentations, four by NRI staff um, and one by an external, Anna Yernek from, from Lund, um, that really summarized the state of knowledge on, 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 on five different subtopics within climate change uh, and had their own suggestions for priorities and, and research gaps. Um, 
that generated a, an enormous amount of discussion. And because there were five, uh, five topics, I can only give the briefest of summaries of, of these. Uh, on food security, um, Alex spoke about need for research on resilience, on risk, on cooperative behavior. Uh, and some of the comments that came up in the discussion um, immediately after his paper and in the broader discussion afterwards uh, on the importance of culture, uh, a very provocative question on the relation between food security and food sovereignty, and similarly on the ambivalent roles of business, the, the private sector entities that, that largely control world food security, the, the attitude and the approach we take to them, the importance of political economy, but also the importance of working with farmer organizations. On forests, um, Truly Santika uh, gave a presentation, just some of the highlights for the importance of trade-offs and synergies between conservation and livelihoods, uh, the importance of power, equity, and then on the idea of modeling for decision support. And this was picked up in some of the discussants comments, um, how to analyze teleconnections uh, between uh, forest systems and the global, uh, and, and the global system, um, the differences between social and natural science methodologies and whether social science methodologies could uh, borrow from the natural sciences in working at larger scale. And then uh, a different line of, of comments on the incentives for growing trees, growing them, not just planting them, um, that being implicitly about dryland uh, afforestation or agroforestry. And I'll come back to that. On water, uh, Pamela's paper uh, talked about the impact on the most vulnerable, uh, the importance of rights-based approaches, and then on interregional and intersectoral cooperation, and again, looking at the role of private sector businesses and financial mechanisms. And some of the comments that came up in the, uh, in the discussion were about looking at the water energy food nexus, um, discussants comments on whether we should be trying to tackle water problems head on or whether the way to tackle them was through other sectors like agriculture. And then again, a provocative question, whether we should be looking at improved wash technology for the rich, water and sanitation technology for the rich, because it's that technology that the poor will seek to emulate and which will have a, uh, uh, a bearing on future consumption of, of technology and resources. Uh, in conflict, uh, uh, Uche and, and Tillman talked about the, the different connections between climate change, fragility, and food insecurity. And two of the things I took from that were the importance of non-extreme cases, low-level, unreported conflict, and the idea of conflict economies, conflict becoming part of the, uh, uh, of the allocation of, of resources and the incentives for people to remain in conflict. Um, Comments coming up in the, in the discussion, how to break cycles of conflict, how to deal with cross-scale linkages between the local and the, the regional or global, and also the importance within this subfield of uh, ideas of theory and of explanation. Uh, what is it we're saying when we, we point to correlations between climate and conflict? Uh, gender and diversity, uh, this was the presentation given by Anna Yernek. Um, she talked, uh, I think it was a great presentation, on the distribution of impacts and responses, the distribution of rights and responsibilities by gender, the importance of information and education, and then some of the ideas that came up were uh, on intersectionality, on caring rights and responsibilities. There was one comment on the role of youth from one of our PhD students. And I should also say that gender was raised in the discussions and in, I think, nearly all cases in the, the presentations made, by, uh, made under the other headings. So it, it very much cross cut the session. And then some other ideas that, that bubbled up in the chat 
uh, the importance of citizen pressure on those in power, uh, the uh, uncertain impacts of Brexit, both on UK agriculture and developing co country agriculture, justice, climate justice, environmental justice, um, and the importance of looking at different timescales for implementation. So proposed future focus of NRI research in this area and next steps. Um, the, uh, we had suggestions on the how question, how to enhance impact that are really too numerous to summarize. Uh, there are around 50 of those bullet points, very, uh, I mean, very skillfully uh, reduced to 50 by uh, Valerie and Richard's facilitation, but still too, too many to summarize now. I think broadly it confirms that the current lines of research we have in NRI on on conflict, on food security, on uh, uh, climate change and forests um, are, are important, should be continued, and that there are many opportunities for, for research on gender and climate change. Uh, next steps, very simply, I think we need a proposed meeting, maybe slightly smaller or within NRI meeting of the program uh, that could discuss both the, the tactical uh, the use of our GCRF QR seed money, and also the more strategic, our broader responses to the session, and then very definitely a reaching back to partners. And uh, just one, this may be a personal point, but I, I was very impressed by the amount and enthusiasm for discussion on dryland trees and dryland agroforestry. Um, it seems that African partners uh, and the partners interested in climate change are generally in the, the drier areas of Africa, they would be interested. And within NRI, we have capacity to look at a lot of different aspects of this household and community level behavior uh, and incentives to, to plant and nurture trees, issues of the economics of tree products, the biophysical aspect of, of where the trees would grow. And I think this wasn't raised in the session, but issues of political economy, transnational action and rhetoric uh, by looking at the Great Green Wall, uh, which is this vast, uh, uh, and I suspect rather existing on the web initiative of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, planting trees across the sudano sahelian zone in Africa. Uh, so that's a, a very hurried attempt to summarize what was a, a fascinating session. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, John. That's quite, quite an achievement, summarizing, as you say, what was a very wide uh, ranging session indeed. Um, uh, we've only really got time for one, possibly two questions. Um, so I'm going to give the one from Keith here. Uh, Keith is asking, or it's, it's a comment type question which is the number of people globally living on high incomes is currently 1.2 billion up from 400 million um, in 2000. The number of people on high incomes is predicted to reach 2.2 billion in 20 years time. High income earners probably have the highest carbon footprint. How might this affect approaches to climate change in low income nations? Uh, well, that's a, uh, a, a, a challenging, uh, ooh, I've, I can start my video, it suddenly appeared. Um, yeah, the, 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 that's a, a challenging question to answer. Um, it, it simply increases the urgency uh, of, um, of adaptation because yes, we, we, we're, we're almost certainly gonna miss Paris targets. That increases the uh, importance of, of uh, uh, adaptation. It also raises the environmental justice uh, issues very sharply. If we are uh, in invoking developing countries to uh, uh, conserve their forests and, uh, and to uh, conserve other uh, carbon sinks uh, to adopt low carbon development models uh, at the same time as, as we, and also taking Keith's point, the middle classes in those very developing countries are increasing consumption. Uh, we have to have much better idea, both of what the ethical issues, but also the, the practical uh, managerial issues of creating incentives for, uh, for uh, carbon sequestration and, and low carbon development. 
Yeah, thanks, John. I think that's a really good uh, a point to leave things on because that, that, that's a really important area for us to, I think, consider as a sort of an organization, if, we, if, we, if we're working globally, both at home and elsewhere, I think that, that raises a really important point. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, we're up against a very tight deadline because it, there's another session going on at two o'clock. So before I just hand back to Adrienne, um, Tim has just asked, uh, could you please add to the chat box um, any comments that you've had on the, the, the process this week? So any, any um, uh, points, what, what was good about it, perhaps what could have been improved, any comments at all on the process for the, the, this fancy uh, conference over this, this week? Uh, meanwhile, thanks to everyone. Thanks to all the presenters. Thanks for the really good comments and suggestions. And back to you, Adrienne. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'll, I'll be very brief. I, I've noticed that Ben is also saying in the chat, please look at the posters, which are available to see. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to say I was really impressed with the <clears throat> summaries that you've presented. And I think there were some very, very interesting common themes emerging across the programmes, as well as the specific challenges that you are each addressing. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody to engage in the programme discussions as they take this forward. Um, the questions, comments in the chat will be harvested and made available so they can be material that would feed into those programme discussions. So a big thank you from me. And I think Andrew also wants to say a few words. Yes, uh, thanks, Adrian. Uh, yeah, a massive thank you from me uh, as well, uh, not only for this session, but for all the sessions this week. Uh, we've had really high levels of participation. Um, I was trying to think of myself, of, to, to myself what, what it's like. It's, it's almost like uh, opening a door in, on the NRI and seeing all the things that are happening inside. Uh, you know, I think it's helpful for us as, uh, as uh, NRI staff, but uh, also I really look forward to developing new projects and programmes with, with you all in the future. So, you know, look after yourselves, stay safe, and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch on, on various issues that we've raised this week. All best wishes to you all. Bye now.